I think we can. Uh, I think we might draw Zhao in at at, at that point. Thanks, Juan. Um, Zhao, I'm intrigued uh, with even the description of a sustainability accounting automation platform. How does this help firms, big and small firms, to transition their portfolios towards sustainable nutrition? How do, how does this actually work? And somebody else today wanted to make a transition. How how does this help? Sure. So, you know, during the conversation in the 33 minutes that we had together <clears> so far, you know, we've heard a bunch of statistics, right? How food generates one third of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, 78% of water eutrophication. Uh, it uses or generates, for example, 40% of biodiversity loss, food waste with 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And the question is, where do these numbers come from, right? And these numbers are very difficult to get. Like these are studies that take often years to complete based on thousands and thousands of farms. And so for a lot of the food businesses out there, it's really complicated to measure the sustainability impact of, of your chocolate snack bar uh, or your, your breakfast cereals. It is really complex stuff. And so usually the tool that you know, companies would use historically to do that is what's called a life cycle assessment. And it's something that can easily cost you $100,000. Uh, it can take you know, more than 12 months to complete. And, and so when you think about the millions and millions of food products we have out there, um, for us to be able to take informed decisions and database decisions to improve sustainability and nutrition, then we kind of need to know how to measure it. And we need to measure it relatively quickly. We can't really wait one year and invest $100,000 mm -hmm. per product. And so this is where sustainability accounting automation tools come in um, because what they do is to uh, enable you to use automation technologies to calculate the sustainability and nutrition impact of a food product in seconds instead of years. And, uh, you know, in a couple of hundred dollars instead of a couple of a hundred thousand dollars. And so as you do that, first you empower R&D teams at companies like Kerry and others to make better decisions, because guess what? R&D uh, usually influences 80% of the resource footprint of a food product because they kind of decide what goes into the product. And if they don't have sustainability information at the R&D stage, you kind of lose 80% of the opportunity to creating uh, the regenerative food product that we are all craving for. And on the second hand, you also, if you don't have these types of accounting automation solutions, then it's very difficult for the retailers to produce sustainability labels and sustainability ratings that can help consumers make the more informed choices that they want to make. Uh, you know, here at How Good We, we're labeling 174,000 products in almost 20 countries all over the world. Uh, we've been doing this for 17 years. And what we've seen over and over again in all the trials we've done with very large retailers for all of these products is that, again, as you communicate in a way that is clear, strategic, and simple enough for consumers to understand, and it's credible enough for them to trust, consumers will sh choose more sustainable and more nutritious products if we make it easy for them to find out uh, those products. And, and so as you do the accounting automation, you achieve those two things. R&D can develop more sustainable products by design and consumers and food citizens, as I prefer to call them, um, mm -hmm. get to also be empowered with the information they need to make the decisions um, that are important for themselves and their families. So, so in essence, we can communicate um we can identify and communicate very quickly the sustainable and nutritional criteria of whatever products are in our portfolio yeah for example let me give you an example we just partnered with carrefour uh, <clears throat> during cop 28 in dubai and in the supermarkets uh, of the the carrefour stores in in dubai uh, you basically you have electronic shelf labels uh, that will tell you the information the name of the product the price tag but those electronic shelf labels also had the carbon footprint of the product. And so you could compare products based on their different carbon footprints. 
and then check out and calculate the carbon footprint of your basket and have the carbon footprint in a traffic light format in a way that you know people can understand whether the carbon footprint is high or low. And the key thing is the, the sustainability of a single food product, of the same food product, you know, think for example, beef can vary 50 fold depending on where the beef is grown, what types of agricultural practices was used, the, um, uh, the types of, uh, of feed that was used. And so using category averages uh, and just comparing products based on the product category uh, or isn't really that accurate. So the accounting automation solution uh, needs to be not a way to simplify the assessments in the sense of making them less precise because the same two beef products can be completely different, but it's really about automating and making sure that the assessment <clears throat> is precise and accurate so that people can only not only choose between different product categories, let's say plant-based meat versus you know your traditional meat, but if the person is really about meat and meat is cultural and meat is uh, what they were grown into, then we also want to help them, hopefully, make better decisions within the meat yeah. that they want to consume. Yeah. Uh, Jack? Yeah, I, I wanted to build on that point I th because I think it's a really important one using you know beef as an example. Because one of the things that I think that we find is that places where governments are sort of most likely to respond to consumer pressure related to things like beef production are, you know, Europe, the UK, North America are more responsive to the consumer. And those are the places that are perhaps the most likely to put into place a meat tax or to put into place policies that make it harder to produce meat. On the other hand, they are often the most productive places in the world for those products. Yeah. And so I think yeah. one of the risks that we have is that, you know, yes, beef is, has higher emissions than poultry and poultry higher than fish and fish more than plant-based. But the reality is that there are these dramatic differences. And if we reduce production in the most productive places and we don't change demand, we actually increase global emissions. And so I think that's, you know, that's a very real risk that we're running with, uh, you know some of the policies that you know that we're seeing today. Yeah, it it seems uh, Zhao and 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 Jack that the the real benefits of this are are around establishing the credibility of the changes that we're making. Uh, that if you can have an independent actor who can say, "Listen, the sustainability profile is is X, and that's done independently," that has enormous benefits externally for the integrity of the change but also has enormous benefits internally in the organization because it seems to me at least that you know finance functions in general um view sustainability as a cost and if you can if you can identify and you can measure sustainability in the way i think as uh, you're suggesting it's it seems to me that it gives further benefits uh, internally as well. Again, am I exaggerating here or is, is this what you're experiencing? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's been a big study based on point of sale data from the sustainable market uh, initiative uh, in the US that studied point of sale data over seven years for, I think it was 400,000 different products. And again, they found out, you know, two things. One, sustainability marketed products uh, are growing 2.7 times faster than conventionally marketed products. So products that are not making those claims. And the second thing that they found out was that sustainability marketed products were able to charge a 28% price premium versus their conventional counterparts. And so there is both the sales velocity and sales premium that sustainability marketed products are experiencing. But what we're also seeing is because the share of new products that are entering into the market that are sustainability marketed is also increasing, the price premiums are kind of reducing a little bit over time, right? So it, there's really a first mover advantage for a lot of these companies who start, uh, who, who have offerings that can be sustainability marketed with integrity uh, to make sure that they, they capture on that opportunity because then at some point they, you know, they, they will have, they will be rated on their sustainability impact regardless of whether they put a claim on pack or not. Carrefour, for example, has the equal score in their 
uh, online in their you know in their the, their French e-commerce portal, um, and it it didn't ask for permission for the brands, right? The brands are being evaluated whether they want it or not. And so the yeah. question really becomes: Do you want to be proactive about it? Do you want to be sustainable by design? Are you really to are you willing to make the innovations uh, that are needed within your within your products so that you can really um, yeah surf this wave and transform sustainability from you know instead of a cost and compliance center into uh, a driver of your bottom line. <laughs>